This morning's readings come from the books of 2 Kings chapter 17 and Hosea chapter 14. In the ninth year of Hoshea, the king of Assyria captured Samaria, and he carried the Israelites away to Assyria and placed them in Halal, and on the Habor, the river of Gozan, and the cities of Medes. And this occurred because the people of Israel had sinned against the Lord their God, who had brought them up out of the land of Egypt from under the hand of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and had feared other gods and walked in the customs of the nations whom the Lord drove out before the people of Israel and in the customs that the kings of Israel had practiced. To this day they do according to the former manner. They do not fear the Lord, and they do not follow the statutes or the rules or the law or the commandment that the Lord commanded the children of Jacob, whom he named Israel. However, they would not listen, but they did according to their former manner. So these nations feared the Lord and also served their carved images. Their children did likewise, and their children's children, as their fathers did, so they do to this day. O Ephraim, what have I to do with idols? It is I who answer and look after you. I am like an evergreen cypress. From me comes your fruit. Whoever is wise, let him understand these things. Whoever is discerning, let him know them. For the ways of the Lord are right, and the upright walk in them, but transgressors stumble in them. This is the word of the Lord. Please be seated. Well, we took a, just a one-week break from our series uh, as we had a Mission Sunday last Sunday. We're back in Hosea now. Joel will be next week, so continue to read along. Uh, and again, if you miss it, you have our permission to go back and cover what you missed. Uh, we read it this way because uh, Second, Cre- Second Kings, that passage there, is talking about this event that we're looking at today. So he- Hosea was a prophet during that time, so we get a little bit of the history there. It's nice when they go together. Uh, today... Uh, what we're going to be talking about uh, in the book of Hosea is uh, an important concept. You know, Hosea was, uh, again, the kind of uh, for the northern kingdom, he was the last one telling them, this is it, you've got to listen, and they still wouldn't listen. And God is going to use Hosea, he's going to use his life, his marriage, which is pretty harsh, that's a very high thing to ask Hosea to do, to demonstrate to the people of God how much they need him, how much he loves them. And we're going to look at that in the context of uh, radical faithfulness, what it means to be radically faithful. And God's going to use Hosea to give an extreme example of what, they look, what that looks like. And when we think about what it means to be radically faithful, it's someone who's, you're going to keep your word. Uh, a couple decades ago, when the first President Bush was running for office, he stood before everybody and said the famous, read my lips, no new taxes. And so everyone said, okay, that's a pretty sure promise he made. But when he took office, he realized things were not great, and he had to put into effect new taxes. And when the next election cycle came around, there was definitely a feeling of, you, you pretty much said, read my lips. You, were, you didn't just say, I guys, we're not going to do taxes. You straight up said, read my lips, no new taxes. And so you couldn't associate uh, him, even though he might have been, you might have loved him, but you still couldn't get over the fact that he made a sincere promise that he wasn't going to do something that he did. And that erodes, eroded some of people's ability to trust and vote for him again. Uh, growing up myself, my father was not one of the most uh, uh, faithful figures in my life. Can't think of a lot of times where he, he kept all of his promises. And so I remember. Uh, after college when I was a youth pastor, I really wanted to gravitate towards men that I thought were great dads because I wanted to see what great dads, faithful dads look like. And so when I was a youth pastor, what I used to do when I was single, I would go to the younger families in the church and offer to babysit uh, their kids for free. Uh, And as someone who has four kids, that's gold. (laughs) But I would offer to babysit their kids free as long as the dad and I could go out for lunch or dinner sometime just to kind of talk and get to know his philosophy and what it means to be a dad and a, fo- and a follower of Christ at the same time. And there's one family that I enjoyed immensely getting to babysit for. It was a dad. He had three daughters. And um, uh, one of the times I was coming to, to babysit, he had just gotten back uh, with his oldest daughter, who at the time was like 10 or something. And uh, he was talking about what they had just done and what 
struck me so profoundly was, so he, uh, again, not all of us are in a position where we can dictate meetings. Sometimes we, we just have to go along with it. But there was a meeting that was supposed to happen that he was in charge of, but he had promised his daughter that there was, some, there was a school project she was supposed to be working on, and he promised her the day she actually finished and turned it in and presented whatever she was to do, he would take her to her favorite restaurant right after school that day. Well, guess what? He made that promise, I think, months earlier. And he had made this meeting scheduled as well. And it just so happened that on that same day, the daughter's project was finished and presented. And he was just randomly telling me how he had to call up everyone in this business meeting and say, sorry, guys, I made a promise to my 10-year-old daughter that I intend to keep. And I remember thinking that's a great example of what a father is supposed to look like. We're going to look at radical faithfulness and how Christ is going to talk about that. Hosea is going to try and live it and show it and how that should impact the way we live today. Let's pray. Lord God, Holy Spirit, we ask now through, uh, through God's word that you would change our hearts. We pray for all the children listening, all the families that have kids that they would not know a day without you as their Savior. We pray for all of us Uh, Again, Holy Spirit, that you would use God's word to help us to die, descend, and become more alive to you. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. So, uh, again, we start off with the passage in 2 Kings 17, 40 to 41. And this is at the end of God saying, this is what's going to happen. This is what they've done. God has, this kingdom has now been divided. The northern kingdom could have been called Samaria. Um, It's been called Ephraim in the book of Hosea. But the northern kingdom of, of God was uh, the northern kingdom had their kings, the southern kingdom had their kings, the kingdom of Judah down here. This one up here was just a string of bad kings, and they kind of got further and further away. And what they uh, were getting into trouble with was uh, believing that they could, out of one side of their mouth, say they are followers of God, but then out of the other side of their mouth, also be worshipers specifically of Baal, another uh, god in the area. But really, it's about their heart, and they thought they could, they could go they could go both ways. They could serve two gods. They could have two gods. And they were taking stuff and pulling it in all together. And what I would call, again, as it looking here, uh, 740, 41 is telling us is that this was an explosive combination waiting to happen. And sometimes explosive combinations can be a great thing. Think of a rocket going up. When the different fuels mix in the engine, that shoots that sucker up fast and far. It is a wonderful thing. Putting a little caramel on something apple is so good, right? little cheesecake, mm, right? That's wonderful. But sometimes combinations can be explosive in a bad way. and can have disastrous results. I've shared this one before, but I find it so telling. There was a satellite um, that was sent up uh, by the space agency, European Space Agency that was supposed to um, go around Mars, supposed to uh, take temperature stuff. And they had been, there had been different designers involved, and half the designers um, put the instruments in and were using the metric, the American system for measurement. And then the other people, designers, were using uh, the European system, them using meters and stuff. So you had people using meters and people using feet and miles and kilometers. And what happened was as it was approaching its supposed destination to orbit, the two systems didn't talk and it got way too close and got pulled in and crashed. Some combinations just don't work. And Hosea has been telling them the combination you have been playing with has failed you from generation to generation. And now that failure is coming back and is going to pick a price. It's going to take a toll. And it's going to end with your destruction, your separation from God. We call that syncretism. Syncretism when you try to take two different things and make them work together. And it just doesn't work. And where they, uh, the people of God messed up the most was thinking that God wasn't just, they were thinking, okay, if we sacrifice like God wants us to do, then he's cool. And that means we can do what these gods wants us to do, and that's fine. And the Baal worship had lots of uh, fertility things, prostitution, even child sacrifice. There were lots of things involved in this. But again, they thought as long as we do what God wants us to do over here, then we can do what we want to do over here. Combine the both, and we have, we're kind of covered on all sides. But what they forgot was that intermingled, what's pushing all of God's law was his righteousness. And his righteousness does not commingle with anything. In fact, it is unrighteousness 
that separates us from God. So God is saying, in righteousness, this is how you follow me. And they're saying, that's great. But adding to or subtracting from it at all would make the practice unrighteous. Because it's not about what you're doing. It's about your heart. So the mere fact that they thought they could just still sacrifice their bulls and then sacrifice children or sacrifice their bulls and do shrine prostitution, the fact that they think they could do it at the same time showed that their hearts was divided. And God is saying, this is it. We're done. So now we get to Hosea. And God is going to tell Hosea, I'm going to use you as a prophet, but not only use your words. This is a high call that Hosea is in. Hosea is going to follow with his life what God is asking. He's not just going to be a mouthpiece. Hosea with his marriage and his children are going to be examples of him trying to get the attention of the people of the northern kingdom to return to the Lord. So let's read verses 1-2. This is Hosea. Uh, this is the beginning of Hosea. When the Lord first spoke through Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, go take yourself a woman of whoredom. It's also a woman of adulterousness and have children of adulterousness or whoredom for the land commits great whoredom by forsaking the Lord. That's a tough word, but it means an adulterous life. So God is saying, Hosea, the people of God, remember we talked about Song of Solomon, why it's so good to read because God, God refers to himself and us as a bride loving the church, as a bride loving the groom. And a lot of times when God talks about the severed relationship because of sin, he talks about himself in terms of a scorned lover. And we hear him saying, listen, uh, the people of God of the northern kingdom have basically committed adultery to me. And so what I want you to do, Hosea, is you're going to live this out and be an example to them. So you're going to go to a woman that you know is probably adulterous. And I want you to marry her. So he knew going into the marriage that she probably wasn't going to keep her marriage vows. And on top of that, as they had children, there's even a hint, uh, the way God talks about the naming of the kids. There's three kids. The first kid, they, they clearly indicate it's from Hosea. But the next two children, there's not that same um, assurity there. And God has the children be named in such a way to talk about they're their, their no longer a part of God's kingdom. So Hosea is, is entered into relationship. He's been asked to enter into relationship with a fallen, broken woman, knowingly. I don't know how many of us would do that. That would be unwise. But Hosea is going to that person. And even in the midst of that, we find out something happens to her. So the first question I want to pose as we read Hosea 1-2, and we're talking about radical faithfulness, is how does God love us? How does he love us? Well, the first thing we need to see right now, the only way he could possibly love us is if we start with grace. There's no way you could love a broken person going into it without starting with grace. And through grace, God is able to love us in our sin. He's told Hosea, go to her in her adulterousness. You know she's not going to be faithful. And knowing that, I still want you to go and marry her. God is able to love us even in our sin. He's got to deal with it. He's going to deal with it. But he doesn't wait for us to be perfect. In our sin, he still loves us. And Scripture is very clear about this. In 1 John 1.10, uh, this is the uh, Apostle John writing. It says, listen, he's talking about confessing. He's talking about going to God. And this is what he says. Listen, if we say we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word is not in us. So if we read this story saying, oh, how could he marry her? You've immediately forgotten that you are her. <laughs> If you think you brought no sin into your marriage, no sin into your relationships, then you don't see how much you need God. So I want to pose right now is, do you see your sin? This is an important element. They didn't. They needed to. Now we move along to chapter 3, verse 1. So, Hosea's interest relationship, but at some point during the relationship, she has left Hosea and gone to be with presumably another man. But the way the passage reads is that she might be with another man, but she also could have been taken slavery or an indebtedness. And so he's saying, Hosea, so you went after, the, I've called you to marry this woman. 
and to love this woman, and she was unfaithful to you. And now she's caught up in something. Imagine how difficult, how difficult that would be to be in a relationship with someone who's constantly tearing at the fabric of the intimacy part of your marriage. That would be so hard. And what does God tell Hosea to do? And the Lord said to me, go again, love a woman who is loved by another man. Again, she's now with someone else. Go back to her. An adulteress, even as the Lord loves the children of Israel, though they turn to the other gods and love cakes of raisins, that was something they would make for Baal. And basically he said to her, what he has to go do is go and he has to pay out a bail price, a ransom price, the price you pray to free someone from who has been indebted or enslaved to someone else. So she isn't just kind of wandered away. She's deep in it away. And he goes, hey, Hosea, I want you to go to her and you need to love her. And it goes on to say after that, and you need to not leave her ever. She's constantly trying to run away from you. Your job is to not leave her. Go get her and go love her and not leave her. The, the reasons that come across my desk, my email, for why couple, married couples want to end their relationship, for why friends want to end their friendship, for why people might want to leave a church, why people want to stop talking to their neighbor, why people want to stop talking to their friends, why people want to cancel their coworkers, are a far cry from how serious this is. And in the depths of this, God is saying, go love her, Get her out of that and don't leave her. We're seeing a picture of the difference between heavenly love and an earthly love. In her sin, you need to go love her. He needs to redeem her. He needs to pay the price to get her out. He needs to save her from that. He needs to restore her. And again, he specifically says, if you keep reading that, he says, and you're not to leave forever. You're not allowed to leave her. Imagine how unjust that would feel. Wait, I can leave this. Look what she's done. And God's like, hey, no. Do you belong to me, Hosea? Yes. Do you want to represent me? He's like, yes. Then you don't leave her. You don't leave her. And so Hosea follows this commitment. God says you must stick with her. So the first one, how does he love us through grace? God is able to love us in our sin. The second one, how does he still love us? <laughs> through grace. <laughs> but through this grace, God was willing to pay a great cost. It was going to cost Hosea. Imagine the pride and dignity it was going to cost him to continue to stay with her. Imagine the conversations he had with other people. It cost him money. It cost him pride. It cost him a lot of things. It's going to cost him energy and time. You know that marriage isn't going to be perfect. It's going to cost him a lot to continue in that relationship. It, who knows what it's costing her? And the point is God doesn't care what it's costing her. He's saying, you need to pay this price because she is your wife. And God is saying, and you are representing me. And just like I, that Christ was willing to love us in our sin, Christ is willing to pay a great price for us. Matthew 20, 28 says this, Even as the Son of Man came not to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many, he was willing to pay the greatest price to redeem us so that we would be his betrothed. So he's not asking Hosea to do anything more than he was going to do himself, and even more. He wasn't asking Hosea to literally die, but he said, you got to pay this price. And God was willing to scorn shame, take on flesh, which is an embarrassment, be mocked, whipped, beaten, and his own life taken so that we could be loved, redeemed, restored, and so that he could never leave us. So what I'm asked this next question is this. For those whom you say you love, for your neighbors, for the lost, for the lost, 
What are you willing to pay? What are you willing to sacrifice? What are you willing to pay to see them know the same love and restoration that we have? Now we get to the two verses I want to look at in Hosea, but we're looking kind of all of it. Hosea 14, 8 says this. Oh, Ephraim, remember this is uh, referring to the northern kingdom. They were the largest tribe. Uh, what, have I done, what have I to do with idols? It is I who answer and look after you. I am like an evergreen cypress. From me comes your fruit. So the next question I want to ask, the first one was how does he love us? This two verses is really about how do we love him now? How do we respond to this? He's now shown us in a pretty radical way that what grace can do, what the grace of Jesus Christ can do can cause you to radically be faithful and love people in ways you probably couldn't imagine. And so he's saying, how do we respond to that? First, go back to the verse. You look at the verse that just starts with the word O oh, there. Uh, o oh, Ephraim. It's actually kind of fun that that O oh, there is a, it's an emotional. We don't quite know exactly. So it's, it reads either like this. He's either saying, oh, oh Ephraim. <laughs> you know, kind of like, oh, you know, like when your, your kid runs into the wall and you're like, oh, what are you doing? Or it's, it's more heartfelt, like, oh, Ephraim. Your heart's breaking for them. We're not quite sure, but it's, it's an emotional, like, oh, Ephraim, what, what are you doing? What are you doing? And this is how God is, wants to end this book. He's saying, I want you to look nowhere else. Oh, Ephraim, why do you look somewhere else? Why are you going somewhere else? for salvation. Why are you looking to add to the salvation that I'm bringing to you? Christ has a similar message for us that we can't go anywhere else aside from him. Uh, there was a, 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 a song that came out about a little over a decade, more than a decade ago, um, but the lyric was Shake It Like a Polaroid Picture. And what happened was it was, uh, uh, I can't remember the name of the group now, it's slipping me, but uh, the, the song was kind of funny, but it told people that it was talking about dance whatever, and you want to shake it, shake it like a Polaroid picture. And so people started, the Polaroid pictures were those instant cameras you take and the picture would spit out. So people were shaking the pictures because like, oh, that's what you do. And then Polaroid uh, had to come out and say, everybody, no, listen, there, that's not how it works. There's no, you don't need any air. The picture processes underneath a piece of plastic. And if you shake it, you actually might create bubbles and ruin the picture. So shaking doesn't actually help it. It actually makes it worse. Syncretism is like that. You think by adding something else, it makes it better, but it actually makes it worse. I'm going to use three analogies to make sure you get this. Second one, you ever been to a restaurant with an amazing chef? I have been blessed to do that a couple of times. And the one thing the chef wants you to know is don't mess with their menu. Do not ask for ketchup if there's no ketchup. Don't ask for something if it's not. They craftily, amazingly put this meal together for you, and they want you to eat it the way they designed it. No substitutions. If you have ever been to one, I've been to a restaurant a couple times, a couple of restaurants I've been to where they, they say on it, no substitution unless you have an allergy kind of a thing. And I'm like, wait, I'm paying for this. And he's like, but I'm making it. <laughs> you are not to substitute. You are to take what the creator has given you. Or lastly, we're talking about doctors. People love to self-medicate and think they know a lot, but the truth is most of us don't. And I know many of people who the doctor will say, you need to change this habit. You need to start taking this pill because of your cholesterol. And some people will not listen to that advice. And that's just as deadly. Do not take away. Do not add to. Do not sink other beliefs. Do not sink other righteousness into the righteousness that Christ has. It is unique. It is otherly. It is only around Christ we find, we find this. So the two things he's saying, if you look at that verse, verse 8 again, what he's saying is there's, there's two things here. One is that nothing else is going to help you. It is I who look after you. It's I who look after you. These other things you're doing aren't actually going to help you. And the second thing I want you to know is that not only will those other things not help you, but remember, I'm the one who is going to help you. So you need to remember these two things. Those things aren't going to help. And remember, I'm the one who is going to help you. Acts 4.12 reminds us there's salvation to no one else, for there's no other name under heaven given by men which must be, we must be saved. Jesus is it. And also when he talks about in verse 8 where he is the evergreen, that the fruit in life is coming from him. 
John 15, 5 says this, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me it is him that bears much fruit. Apart from me, you can't do anything. Those other things won't help, but only God will. He is an evergreen tree, year-round, full of life for you. So how do we love him? Through humility, we must trust him. So he loves us through grace. Through humility, we must trust. We must trust that nothing else is going to help us and only he can. Do you struggle? Do you struggle to trust his ways and his word over your own? Lastly, verse 14, 9. Whoever is wise, let him understand these things. Whoever is discerning, let him know them. For the ways of the Lord are right, and the upright walk in them, but transgressors stumble on them. Again, lastly, how do we love him? What he's saying in this passage is that in your mind, in your mind, you've got to get around this fact. You've got to understand up here that linking with anything else isn't going to work. It's going to actually make it worse. You need to understand that it's only God's righteousness. And then it also says, by your experience, what that pastor is saying is you need to know it by up here and you need to know it by just living it. You need to know it by trusting. You need to know it by listening in your life, by experiencing that nothing else will save you, nothing else will help you except God alone. So we love him through humility to trust him. And this last one, we love him through humility to follow him. This is how we love him back. Through humility, we trust him. And through humility, we follow him. John 8, 12. Again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me, whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. We need to humbly trust that he knows more than us, that his righteousness is better than anything we can add to it. And we need to humbly follow wherever he leads us. Do you doubt his direction for you? We need to humbly trust. We need to humbly follow as he is graciously loving us. Again, we're talking about radical faithfulness. We have a God who it was time for him to fulfill his promise. He didn't just cancel the meeting. He sent his son who was residing in the heavenlies down to earth. He changed everything to keep his promise to us. He called on Hosea to love someone unlovable faithfully to show us that that is God loving us. We must see ourselves as Gomer, the wife of Hosea. If you want to read this book well, you need to see that in this passage, we are Gomer. And God is the one who needs to be continually coming after us and saving and redeeming us. We need to see how Hosea by God's own command, is acting out the story that Jesus will be doing for us. So ready for this book to make sense to you. You need to see yourself as Gomer, as someone who needs to be saved, as someone who has an adulterous heart. But at the same time, we need to be like Hosea to the broken sinners around us. At the same time, we are to represent Christ as he came. So we must be like Hosea, willing to pay the price willing to love and go after the broken. Because that's what Christ has done for us. Hosea is a picture of impossible, radical faithfulness. But the true picture is what Jesus Christ did on the cross and what he's doing for us today. Let's pray. Lord God, I'm sure... There are many moments when you look at us and say, oh, people, why aren't you listening? Lord, help us to hear you. Lord, help us to see that apart from you is death, but with you is life eternal. 
Lord, help us to see how great and majestic you are. Help us to trust in your righteousness and not in our own. Lord, help us to not sink our hearts, but to keep it just for you and you alone. We thank you for this morning. We thank you for your word. And thank you for Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Please stand for our final song.